This channel is not intended for children. Please kickstart responsibly. Hey everybody, another week's gone by and I'm trying to stay on time. And there is a ton of stuff, both for the uh, regular board game episode and for the RPG episode. The RPG episode is so jam-packed with stuff, I'm hoping a couple of them cancel just so I could fit it all into the description. So there's all kinds of stuff going on. The whole month has been this way. And it's kind of slowed off or slowed down a little bit um, after Tuesday. So I might try to pack in a couple of episodes over the weekend for July just to kind of get a jump start on things. I don't know if I'm going to be able to have the time for it or not, but the way things are going right now, like, wow, there's just so much crazy amount of stuff coming through. Um, yeah, it's, uh, just keep in mind, it's the beginning of June, so all of the June episodes are pretty much still valid. So if you missed anything, just click on the name, click on the playlist, it'll pop up with the, uh, you know, you can set it in, in reverse order or whatever the case is, and then you can have all the catch-up time you need, and uh, it should help you out there. We got Father's Day coming up here in America. I think it's next weekend, might be the weekend after. So uh, if you got a dad that likes to play board games, maybe something will uh, excite him, and, uh, you know, you can pick it up for him too. With that case, let's see what happens. Let's go to it. Then we have a little bit of a strange one. This is Q, Que, K, Key, Q, E. It's about currency. And 5th anniversary edition, so I guess they've been making these games for 5 years. All made out of wood. Doesn't have to be though. There's nothing about the wood that makes it in any way special to the idea of currencies. Um, it just, I guess they have a laser printer or a laser cutter and they, they want to use it. So that part's fine. It does give you a little bit more of a um, solid product and in that sense. Uh, hopefully you don't lose any of the pieces because <laughs> you won't be able to replace it too easy. 30 to 40 minutes to play at least two players. And now they've incorporated rules for digital currencies. So that part's pretty cool. Here's the thing. I'm a, a graduate of the School of Economics out at UC Santa Cruz. Um, which is a pretty good school for that kind of thing. And one of the first things they teach you in economics is that it is the dismal science. It can be very boring. <laughs> um, games uh, work well because the, the way that the numbers are set up, the rules are pretty easy to understand, and um, it, it fits really well. But it's not everybody's cup of tea, and things like currency manipulation can be difficult to understand. If you got a crowd that's good with math, I think they might enjoy this. Um, or even teaching them the game style, it might be good for a high school student who's uh, starting to learn economics. Here in the United States, we learn economics in what we refer to as 12th grade. Then we have one I'm trying to understand, and I think what it is is a puck that's got an RFID signal or some type of AR technology that allows you to view the battlefield with your phone or tablet and they have something like a hundred animations put into each character so you would buy each character and then utilize it in whatever game that you want and then they would animate so if you want to check out what they're doing that part is fine uh, if you have a game that you already want to put that in obviously you won't need to paint them but uh, it's kind of an expensive technology uh, it's coming out in December if you get the starter package. It's 30 bucks for the starter, and that gets you an account with two fighters, a vehicle, and uh, no monthly fee. So that's good that there's no monthly fee. I don't know how long it's going to be around, if it's part from the website or, or what that deal is. So that's kind of part of the risk. It may not exist in a year or two years or a month or whatever the case is, um, but hopefully it will. Uh, until that time it'll be a neat little technology um, it's not got anything that is released with um, you know like Warhammer or any of those other games so if you have a system that's agnostic to the minis that might be the best indication for this most of the characters are on a sci-fi uh, bend so if you have that type of game it might be the best then next we have similar uh, Warhol this doesn't require you to constantly be moving your tablet around or phone around in order to see how the game is being played. This is done on your computer. So this is a war game simulator. Um, it's basically tabletop simulator, 
but with more tools to make wargaming a little more accessible and easy. So you can take a quick look at it and see uh, if it's going to work for you. They've got a bunch of different fantasy type of characters, um, mastodons and dragons and all that kind of stuff. I think I see some mechs in the uh, screenshots. Uh, I'm not sure. They're definitely not going to be attached, just like the other game, uh, the tabletop fighters, to any particular system because they would have to license that out. But uh, for right now, it might be generic enough for you to use for whatever uh, things you might need. Um, it does have you know, some neat looking terrain and all that kind of fun stuff. And if you're not a painter, but you still want to play, then uh, this will allow you a socially distanced method of doing so. It'll also allow you, if you're going out to all these conventions um, that are coming up and opening up again, and uh, you make friends or you see friends that you haven't seen in a while, and they're from a different part of your state, town, or whatever, you can't get access to that, uh, play with them very much, then uh, this might be something that you can utilize to continue playing with them that makes it a little bit easier than something like Tabletop Simulator does which is more generic and uh, you know you have to do a lot of programming and whatnot this should have some of the basic moves and rules already programmed in for you to utilize now we have a new roll and write game this is rune and write and it is um, it's got a solo mode and they're the the way it functions one to four players and I think that's just because of the number of sheets that are available and pencils and and that kind of stuff you might be able to expand it further uh, everyone kind of runs off of their rune rolls simultaneously and assigns them as part of this circular uh, paper and depending on how you utilize your runes that's going to make the difference of how things get scored at the end there's not a lot of information as to how the game actually plays on the sh on the page if you wanted to find out more about it you can watch the videos uh, i got about uh, 80 to go through so i'm just not going to be able to watch all of the explanations but if it interests you check it out the idea here that i find most interesting is that it is simultaneous play so if someone doesn't like downtime or you have a hard time keeping their uh, attention span and all that uh in order to keep from ruining game night this might be something that keeps everybody involved and uh, you can save the more uh time consuming games for a different group but everybody could jump in and play or you can play on your own and then explain it to them later should only take 30 to 40 minutes and not be affected by player counts so time constrained people this could be a good game for you too and then we have total control wrestling and it is um hard to describe because when they show the gameplay it's just two guys that are very enthusiastic sitting at a table and you can't actually see any of the rolls that are made or what's on their sheets of paper it seems to be a book with a lot of sheets and paper and tables required to verify your moves um, as far as a board game goes there are other wrestling board games that have colorful characters and uh, standees at a minimum there's different promotional things that you can do and while these folks may be like I say very very enthusiastic about the game and wrestling and all that kind of fun stuff um this may be more for the type of crowd that likes rpgs and um you know going through the tables and all, all that kind of stuff as opposed to somebody that wants to emulate something they would find in wwe or ecw or any of that kind of stuff um it's a it's a mental game it's theater of the mind for sure and um it it for an industry that's all about selling, it's hard to say that they did a good job selling this um, game because you can't really see a whole lot of what's going on. So if you like wrestling and you haven't tried one of the other games, then maybe take a look and see if this will work for you or you're into wrestling RPGs. Then we have Keep, which is a roguelite board game. So you're going to have some cards that create the dungeon castle whatever it is you got some meeples you have some randomly uh situated uh keeplings which i think are the enemies items that are your weapons the key that is the MacGuffin of it all and uh health dice so you'll run around uh trying to fight off the various keeplings and as your health deteriorates uh you'll roll some challenge dice to make a, the decisions on if you win or not and uh, keep moving your meeple through the dungeon 
There are other, I think it's called One Deck Dungeon. There's a few others that fit within this space. So if you like this kind of game, if you've played those other ones, maybe you'll enjoy this one as well. Um, it has a simplified art scheme. It's for ages 7 and up, so it's not too bad. only takes 20 minutes to play, but it does require 2 to 6 players. So if you just wanted to play something fast with your kids, maybe this would work out pretty well for them. We've had a bunch of different games on the channel that would ask questions of a group, and this Consequences game seems to have done a good job of not falling for the uh, cheap heat, as a wrestling term would go, of uh, asking questions that are far too personal. This has just quirky questions that you can answer multiple ways, um, and it would still be a correct answer. You don't have to uh, reveal some crazy truth that would be... Uh, a binary choice and then eliminate the the joy of playing the game again so it's got extra replayability um, you're gonna go through and then there's gonna be a bunch of different types of cards some of them are challenges some of them are questions and as you uh, go through you get to pick from each character to go through um, so if it says like confess to a lie you've told in the past it doesn't have to be the worst thing you've ever said to your wife it could just be you know um, I don't know what kind of lie people tell. <laughs> um, I don't have a wife to lie to, so I don't have much of a list. Um, but take another player's seat if it looks more comfortable than yours. You do that, I mean, you can do that over and over and over again, and other people can do that. You go sit in dad's chair or whatever the case is. So um, it's much more replayable than the stuff we saw last week, the week before. And uh, I think if you thought that question games for the group were fun, maybe this one would be a lot more enjoyable uh, because it has a, a lot of different consequences. Dwarves is a game that came out last year. Uh, there was some content for it. This thing almost has a thousand backers already, so you can tell it was pretty successful. This time they are in winter, and then there are some lost tribes to go along with it. It is a survival game. It is very cute. Uh, little tiny folks. As you can see, like the tree ant there in the middle, it has uh, a not too... Um, not too heavy art style to it, so it's it's on the the cuter end of things. It's on the friendlier end of things, but there's still monsters and um, you know their weapons and all that kind of fun stuff to go along with it. Uh, part of the Lost Tribes comes with ogres, crystal dwarfs, half bloods, and uh, other fun things. So you could use these for other uh, RPGs if you wanted to. If you wanted to change up the style, would probably work great for something that would fit with humans and other uh, humanoids in uh, something like Humblewood. Um, so yeah, that part's up to you how you want to play it, but it's been popular enough to keep coming out with new content, so that's always a good sign. Then we have My Singing Monsters, the board game. I do not know where this comes from. Apparently this was a, a different type of game. I'm going to guess video game, maybe? Um, for the Switch or mobile? Who knows? But uh, this is the card and board game version of it. It comes with uh, weirdos. It comes with uh, a deluxe edition where you can pick up uh, painted minis if you need those things. Um, if you're a fan of the game wherever it's from, then perhaps the bringing this board game version to life is the way to go. Uh, it's been very popular as a trend to bring board games, uh, to create board games out of other mobile games. Uh, 30 to 45 minutes to play for two to five players ages eight and up I'm gonna guess that you know if you had a kid or if you played this game before what the deal is with it um, because there is no technology here that will make the monsters sing <laughs> so maybe you have to sing yourself at the table it looks like wacky Pokemon so that's that and next up we have the return of where in the world the quiz game this is actually, it looks like a fun quiz game. It looks like they have interesting questions and the whole deal. Um, it will be made in English and Swedish. So if you were interested in that kind of thing, I don't think it's anywhere else in the world. Uh, they've been having a hard time getting it, uh, getting it built, getting it made, and they've been trying. I think this is the fifth time it's been out. Um, I, maybe it's the board, maybe the simplicity of it. In which city was the cassette tape invented? What year? You know what I mean? It's questions like that. This country consists of two island groups, Ratak Chain and Ralan Chain. Ratak means sunrise and Ralak means sunset. What is it? 
So you learn some geography. Uh, which country has the highest beer consumption per capita? Wouldn't you want to know where that is? I think it's Belgium. But, you know, it's interesting stuff. I'm sure some of it changes as it goes on, but I think they're good questions. I think they're, they're types of questions that you can ask many times, and there's more than one, I believe, per card. So uh, that should make it easier for you uh, to keep playing over and over again. Trivia games can get boring pretty quickly, so you do have to replace them as you keep going. And, um, you know, it's, it's, I think, an interesting format with the way that the map works and all the, the way the dice and blocks and everything are set up. So if you like trivia games, this could be one for you. Then we have a standalone prequel to the Hall of the Mountain King game. This is Fall of the Mountain King. And you are going to be playing a war that leads to the lore of the first game. So it will be Trolls versus Gnomes. I think that's a fun way to go. You have a solo mode, so uh, one to five players. Ages 14 and up, um, you could probably do it with less. Uh, be a little younger, just use your discretion. Uh, whatever fantasy level you want to go with for your children. Um, 125 different trolls and 25 champions. So you can use these on many other games if you want to. There's uh, some gnome miniatures and all that kind of stuff. I think gnomes are underutilized. And uh, things like Massive Darkness, they bring out dwarves um, that can be evil. I think if you're going to play some Underdark campaigns and all that kind of stuff, it might be nice to have some uh, villains that are gnomes because it's just hasn't been used as fully as it could be. You can take a look at the rule book, check it out yourself, look at the original game. I'm sure they're pretty close in the way that they're told, but uh, the outcome is inevitable, but it, it's a fun ride getting there. Then we have an expansion that brings in more character options. This is Adventures in Alchemy for the Adventure Tactics game. Adventure Tactics is a fairly generic name, so it might not tell you exactly what the game is like. Uh, I think it's going to be like uh, Final Fantasy Tactics is the idea behind it. Um, what was it? Little Tiny tiny Kingdom? Um, well, there's a Tiny series uh, that I have a zombie game for somewhere above me that I can't find. But uh, they came out with a tactics game. It had like a 3D uh, board along with it. I think that's similar to what's going on here. They have some minis. They have standees for a bunch of other things. But the main thing that they're offering is more options for you to be able to play through cam the campaign with other character uh, options so that they can become like a prestige class instead of just making it to the end of um, their stories. So... There are three new elite classes, one new starter class, uh, I think it's Oracle, uh, Mimic, and Druid are the classes it could be, and uh, that's for the new one, but there's, I believe, more content for the ones that you already had uh, that they exist. So give that a go. Some of the standees, um, or some of the, yeah, some of the standees have uh, plastic uh, miniatures, but not all of them. Just keep that part in mind. Check it out if you played the game, liked the game. Some of the folks on Facebook that I have in different groups were excited about it, so maybe that's an indication for you. Then we have a collaborative storytelling game of Campfire. If you plan on going camping uh, soon, or just this year, or whatever the case is, then you might want to tell some stories. This is going to be delivered around October-ish, so maybe you'll be able to do it for Halloween. Uh, the idea is you use cards, you use coins, you use whatever tools that they give you to help weave a terrible story in the sense that it terrifies you. Uh, not that it's bad. I mean, it might be bad. It depends on your group. So give that a shot. The uh, horror, other horror anthology, um, uh, American Horror Story, I think will be out by then. Usually it's out around October. So maybe that'll give you some inspiration. Um, there is lots of interesting things that uh, will be available to you, including, I believe, a digital version. Uh, so if you wanted to collaborate with people uh, that are elsewhere before you go camping with them or after kids come back from summer camp or whatever so they can still talk to them, then that might work for you. There is also a podcast, Vintage RPG, that is somehow tied in with this. So if you need more story hooks or ideas, maybe you can pick it up from there. Speaking of podcasts, we have a gaming podcast that uh, a lot of people like, but I've never heard of. 
Uh, well, I've heard of only from <laughs> giving you information when they pop up on Kickstarter, but I've never been able to watch any of their content. This is the Secret Cabal. Uh, why have I never watched any of their content? Because it takes forever <laughs> to make these uh, videos for you guys. Um, I do all the custom graphics and everything like that, so it's uh, it's time consuming. So I don't have time to listen to these guys while I'm paying attention with my eyeballs to what I'm, I'm creating. For them, they've got some uh, different uh, like Gloomhaven um, content that you can pick up, uh, various promos, cards, and things. When I've picked up cards and, and promos for uh, other games, sometimes it's usable content, sometimes it's not. So just check and, and see if the uh, the stuff that's for the game that you want is going to be usable. I'm pretty solid on saying that the scenarios for the Gloomhaven stuff will be playable, but sometimes they just include things from characters that are on the uh, podcast, and then there's nothing else written for them. So just keep that part in mind. Uh, they've got stuff for Robinson Crusoe, Fireball Island, and a lot of other games that are uh, very popular for folks. There's even some flasks if you think you need it coasters if you want to be clean. Then we have a game called Fjordar, and I'm pretty sure that this takes place within the time period of the game, uh, or it's not the game, the TV show Vikings. So it's part of that same civil war, which lasted for quite a while. It wasn't like a quick thing that, that went over. But I think parts of this and parts of that overlap. So if you're a fan and you wanted to play through various aspects of it, here you can. Um, there are some tiny characters, and uh, I don't think that they're in the 28 millimeter scale. I think they're down to like the 10 or 15 millimeters. They look tiny. Um, little tiny ships, little tiny um, churches and, and uh, beacons and other things, villages, that uh, you can pick up as you go along. The artwork looks pretty neat. Various leaders. Uh, I can't see who all of them are, so I can attach them to uh, you know the characters from the show. But uh, the only character I give a damn about is Catherine Winnick because uh, she very, very, very attractive. <laughs> the only reason I watch Big Sky. <laughs> so there you go. That's, uh, that's all I got to say about that. Then we have Night Quest, which is a drinking game. And I've made it clear every time we uh, review a drinking game that it's mainly a, a very young person, like a 22, 23 year old kind of deal, uh, before you actually start to drink good things that cost money. Um, that's what the gaming side is usually about, because it's more about just consuming. This is a little bit different. This is more about how you consume, and it creates a um, an adventure to go along with it, so there's a, a real through line to it, rather than just getting trashed. So instead of drink more and buy more, it's, uh, you know, have somebody pick you up like a wheelbarrow and then see if you can drink and other things like that. So I think it's a little more fun um, for the older crowds, the physical stuff. I don't know if that's going to work for everybody, but if you're still able to do a headstand or a keg stand, you know, then uh, I'm sure you'll be set for this. Uh, it feels a little bit post-college, but not quite. 30 in the age range that uh, might enjoy this the most if you try to play this at a bar there's just too much going on so um, maybe it wouldn't be as fun there but if you're at home and yeah you, you have a bunch of D, D people and you can't otherwise play or you want to involve some other people and you don't want to play the role-playing game that night maybe this will work for you then we have some World War II revisionist history. This is Operation Storm Stalin's Barbarossa. What if the Soviets attacked first? So what happened in 1941, according to this, is um, the Germans ended up attacking the Russians and double backing and betraying them. Well, what if the Russians betrayed the Germans? So that's an interesting concept. Um, you get the regular war game style maps you get your units on the little squares uh, most of the time we see things that are historical and uh, trying to be factual and letting you play through uh, play out the the missions I like the idea here of it being something new and different so that you don't know necessarily all the ways that um, it actually happened you can't look it up how it actually happened so uh, it's more open-ended um, if you were to go read some a book like Dominion, which is also about a fictional World War II, Man in the High Castle, any of that kind of fun stuff, um, it could be a lot of fun just having an overall what-if 
in World War II uh, grouping of entertainment. Next up we got robots, um, mechs, Jaegers, whatever you want to call them. This is the Tempest Assault Force. And normally I would put these on the RPG episode, but as I said in the opening, man, there's just way too much stuff in there for me to pack in, so it just felt better to stick it over here. It is 3D printable, and I think you can actually get some physical pledges done as well, so they'll print it out for you. And you can get some scenery, like they're building the Jaeger there in the bottom right, or you can just print them off yourself. There's some tanks and other things, uh, different types of... Uh, things available to you if you want it um, there's no game with this so you'll be able to use it in whatever game you want and I think they look pretty cool especially the way that it, they end up looking a little on the dirty side um, yeah I'd love to see what people do with it if you're gonna make your own uh, Jaegers for Pacific Rim or any of the other mech games that are out there then uh, I think there's a great way it's a good way to go so uh, yeah customize it make it as you know, interesting as you want it's uh, pride month I believe make a rainbow version you do whatever you want so have a good time then we have Wizards of the Grimoire which is another game that tells its story through cards and it is about a wizard's duel it takes about 20 minutes but does require somebody to play against so two players only the idea here is there is uh, 60 cards two player aids and you have mana and you have uh, spells so 60 each 60 uh, spells 60 mana unlike Magic the Gathering um, you're not gonna get land that is uh, it's, it's not gonna function the same way the, the cards themselves are gonna have a type and a type of activation with the mana and you're gonna be offered various synergies you might not be able to play them in your hand um, it's Similar, I mean, same basic concept of powering things up and having resources available to use the cards as the way Magic the Gathering has, but it's just done a slightly different way. If you like the idea of playing against wizards, but you do not like the idea of having to buy tens of thousands of dollars or whatever it comes out to now worth of cards, then uh, maybe this is for you. At least it's some easy way to get started. Artwork looks good, um, very professional looking, so that's always a plus. And, uh, you know, it still can be fun. You just have to have a buddy that's ready to uh, play it along with you. And uh, you're going to have to make some various choices. From the way that the spells look, it feels to me like they're all black and blue decks. Then we have a version of Sea Tour, which is a game that sold 100,000 copies in Europe. This is Taurus. It looks a lot to me like the Chinese game of Go. Um, you're going to have all these Fruit Loops that you're going to flip back and forth and fill up the board trying to take as much area control as possible. Um, if you have played Sea Tour before, then maybe this uh, added version with better pieces is the thing for you. Take a quick look and see if that's the case. Um, 100,000 people, or 100,000 sales with solo variants for you to practice on. I think that's a, it's a pretty solid game. I don't know why it never really made it over here, but uh, like I say, maybe it actually is Go, and I know a lot of people play that type of game, maybe just haven't had the opportunity to give it a shot. Oh man, I wish I could tell you more about this game, but what they decided to do is speak in Chinese, even though it's from Hong Kong, and everybody speaks English in Hong Kong, and they put the color of the subtitles as not white with a... Uh, like a, a shadow stroke around them and it matches the background color <laughs> of the things they're displaying so you can't really read it so um, that is unfortunate and I'm just gonna go by what it says on the, the front it's a matching game with species and you're gonna have them across five com uh, continents I don't know if that is meant to make you think about the world and how it should be sustainable. That would be great. But if they could put as much thought into making the game clear for people, maybe putting some actual graphics of how the game gets played, that would be helpful. Um, if not, I mean, 
they're trying to make the sustainability message work. If you speak Chinese, then maybe uh, you can pick up the game and enjoy it from there. Or they possibly just want to exclude everybody that's not in Hong Kong from the message of saving the planet from their game. I don't know. But, you know, I try to cover everything. Then we have Carry On, which is about packing your luggage. That's the basics of it. So if you want to play this card game, uh, there's different values to the sizes of uh, the stuff that you can pack into your suitcase. And it is supposed to evoke the feelings of travel. But to me, it's like the worst part of travel is trying to get through the airport. So, um, you know, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. Uh, I, I think a lot of people want to get out of the house. I don't know if everyone wants to fly anywhere. Uh, I want to go see some stuff in Vegas, mostly of the food variety. And uh, when I fly to Vegas, I almost never carry anything with me because I live an hour away. So I fly over there, I do whatever the thing is, and then I fly back super early in the morning. So I usually don't have to pack anything, even a toothbrush, which I get from the store uh, at the CVS that's across the street uh, out on the strip. So, <laughs> meh, if you want to want to fly if you want to pack stuff then uh, maybe you could pack this card game to play along with the family while you're there and then we got pirates cutthroat uh, cove pieces of eight it's got some neat little uh, black and white uh, graphics on a lot of the events and then you have um, these cards that are part of the chest that will give you coins some of them could be cursed and the idea is you can trade things around your hand to other players, hopefully giving them the horrible stuff and swapping it for good stuff. I like the idea. So the idea of giving somebody uh, something else that's terrible will have them calling you a scallywag that fits totally within the pirate kind of world and you're also stealing from other people. That's a thing that pirates do. So for a little card game of five to eight players, then uh, it sounds like it would be pretty fun. Uh, I don't know what the player count is that makes it the most fun. Five is pretty high up there because then a family of four couldn't even play. But um, maybe you can invite some couples over, that kind of thing. Then we have the return of the Dueling Dragons game. This is about learning math skills. Some simple math skills, addition, subtraction. Uh, hopefully some critical thinking. Uh, I don't know why it didn't do as well as it could have. It's got a pretty um, low uh, entry point right now. 1500 bucks isn't a whole lot. Uh, but it's going to need more than the five backers it's got. Uh, as, as of this recording, hopefully you guys will see it and check it out. I think the card design might be what's holding it back because it looks like it would be fairly difficult to read in the little text boxes. There are other ways for them to utilize the negative space and actually fill it in with other information that I don't think that they're fully utilizing and it makes it look cramped and hard to see. The artwork looks like you would get on a, another like Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh, whatever type of game. Um, or maybe there's just not as much of a um, demand for those types of games. Uh, it's a little bit fantasy, but it, the Pokemon side of it kind of overwrites the, the look of it. Uh, if they were to change up the, the way that those uh, lower text cards are written and space it out a little better or maybe change the size of certain fonts and that kind of stuff so that it uh, is easier to read, I think that might be the secret sauce even if they have to shrink the pictures a little bit to make it all work. But um, you know I'm looking at it on my screen that's about the size of what the card should be and it's too tiny to read. And then we have what a lot of people learn for their first uh, types of economics. Uh, tutelage, Lemonade, Boss Chief. This is a two-player game about having a lemonade stand. And there are a bunch of different types of auctions also included as part of it. So uh, as you can see, there's the Liars Auction and the Pusher Luck Auction. Uh, and those are great ideas. So um, Lemonade stands we used to have on the Apple II the green screen and I know a lot of you folks out there because I see the demographics were in the exact same broke ass school district <laughs> I was and uh, you had the Apple twos um, but you know Oregon Trail all that kind of stuff everybody had to play the lemonade game because you got your computer time through that and that's a little bit of what this is about you had to set prices and then it would rain or something else would happen and you'd, you'd lose out 
Um, this offers some ideas on auctions being the best way to sort out prices and figure out the true value of things is to try to figure out how much people will pay for it. And there are ways to bring the price up or bring the price down, whatever the auction type happens to be, that uh, will help you set that. And I think that's pretty neat. If uh, you want to check it out, if you want to teach your kids with this type of game, there's a good opportunity. Then how about a figure agnostic game for mechs? We just had a campaign pop up that had some mechs in it. This would be a perfect combination, right? So check it out. See if it's what you would like. Um, there are a lot of robots out there. There are a lot of STLs that you can print off on your own. If you haven't been seeing them, it's because you haven't been checking out the RPG episode. It will be jam-packed full of all kinds of stuff that should work pretty well for this. Lasting Tales and other system agnostic games are out there. Rain in Hell is coming out from Tabletop Minions. And that one's more for demons and that kind of thing. But it is a trend that seems to be the perfect timing for uh, is having these um, figure agnostic uh, game books pop out because there's just so many cool miniatures and talented sculptors now that there's no real um, gatekeeper between you and them so that you can get some really awesome pieces that all these people have to do is go out and they put out a Patreon or they put out a Kickstarter and you can get access to their talents. So uh, yeah, I would say if you're into this type of robot fighting, give it a shot. And uh, there's no shortage of cool things out there for you to use. Then if you're like me and you watch a lot of other YouTube channels, especially the animal ones, Ants Canada and uh, others that have bugs, then uh, maybe you have thought about what it would be like to take those tabletop war game experiences and put it down into the world of bugs. And that's what Vermin Vendetta is about. You would get to play as the various types of weird crustaceans, cockroaches, ants, spiders, beetles, and the like, fighting against each other for dominance. You have 30 to 45 minutes per player to do your best to take over the yard. It's on a tiny scale. It's kind of neat. It's not really like a role play or any of that type of stuff. It is set up by the factions. Um, everybody has their own kind of deal. You don't have to necessarily dislike cockroaches. You don't have to like them either. Uh, you could be the ants that go in and eat them. Um, you'll learn, a, hopefully, a new perspective, a new interesting thing about these little critters because they're everywhere. They outnumber us. They outweigh us. They could take us down, and they will eventually own our bodies. And uh, why not uh, get used to it now? Check them all out, all the cool things that they can do and bring to the environment. And maybe even it would be a good way to inspire you to learn more about these little critters. Um, or murder and attack your enemies in the uh, unforgiving way nature does. So check it out. My money's on the ants. Then we have a game named A-Hole. And I'm pretty sure that this game already exists with regular decks of cards. But maybe the rules are a little bit different. Um, there are ways to uh, call your friends various profane uh, things. You punch them in the face, all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, that part is neat. Um, it's also supposed to be an LGBTQI business and an Asian business. And it's Pride and Asian American Awareness Month, I think, or very close to it. So if those things matter to you, they're very helpful. The color scheme is incredibly blue. So, um, yeah, I think they could have uh, made it a little more colorful to make it more appealing, but that's, you know, maybe it will, maybe it won't. That's That, that part's up to you uh, if you're going to pick it up or not. They're almost to their goal. They need another 100 people or so, and uh, then they'll be able to have it all go there. You need, from the look of it, four people to play the game, and I'm pretty sure that's the way that the card game goes. There's a Filipino game. Uh, that takes 13 cards that my neighbors would play it seems pretty similar so it just reminds me of that so you might need this might not there were no tokens in that card game so maybe that's uh, that's the way it goes um, if you don't want to use them as buttholes they are also the same look as the endeavor tokens for kingdom death so there you go then we have cartoon club which is kind of like a take on Pictionary but it gives you other types of prompts so you're going to draw within a couple seconds, uh, sorry, within a couple minutes, 
and the first few seconds you're going to be given a story to go by and then you're going to include the idea card that you pull in the story or you're going to steal an idea from someone else in the group that you're with the idea being that there's going to be a two to three minute timer so it doesn't matter if you're an uh, effective artist or not you're just going to draw something and try to be some type of creative a lot of people are resistant to performing um, activities that they don't think that they're good at they don't even want to try and that's what makes Pictionary work pretty well so I think that same logic of getting people to participate and it doesn't matter if you're good or bad um, works in this instance this was made by a lady who took a bunch of ideas that she data mined from a creative uh, drawing class that she was teaching at the time so um, you know I don't know if everybody that came up with the ideas for themselves or getting the uh, royalties off this or if she's just biting it off, but you know, who, who cares? Um, I think it'd be something that just like Pictionary would be fun for um, people that are older and people that are younger alike. Then we have Daimyo Senso, which is very much like Rising Sun, but it has a solo mode. It has a very similar map. It's got a bunch of different factions in it and the gameplay is going to be different but if you already bought rising sun and you're like me and you never got a chance to play it because you couldn't get anybody to play with you you could use all those cool things that cool mini or not sticks in their games and then replace uh what's going on here with that and just use the solo rules and the cards and other things like that that's how i would use this game um it's not all that expensive uh, it's a you know a functional different idea a lot of people like the idea of playing um, in feudal Japan and uh, everybody enjoys having a, a solo mode for when you want to play a game and you can't get anyone else to play with you it should be completable in under two hours so it is not the type of game that is for a lunch break but uh, if you got some time on the weekend after dinner whatever the case is then it might make a fun evening then we have an expansion for the game farts and fairies um, the ideas behind this it's like they just add the word fart to everything um it doesn't have to be any particular type of fart they're just going to keep throwing the word fart on things okay sometimes that's cool sometimes it's not whatever the case is uh there's supposed to be an adults only version but i don't see anything as far as the cards go that w would be why it's adults only maybe it's a bunch of uh like our Ruth Bader Ginsburg jokes or something that kids wouldn't get I don't know uh, I have a joke book that's called the adults only joke book and I was really disappointed when it was just adult uh, jokes for old people and it wasn't like actual you know, body blue humor so I'm I'm suspicious this is gonna fit within that range uh, if you've already played the game then maybe you'll be interested in it um, it's just not funny enough for me I mean, farts are funny generally. Uh, I've enjoyed them myself. Laughed a few times here and there. But it just doesn't seem like there's as much cleverness as there could be. So if it's for you, if it's lowbrow, if just the word fart makes you laugh, then maybe that'll be enough for you. But uh, I don't see why it wouldn't. I, I don't see any reason why it would be an adult-only pack. Maybe you'll check it out. Then we have a, an expansion for Gorgon's Lock, but as they mention even in the video, this has yet to have the original game delivered to the people that bought it. So nobody knows if it's actually fun or if they should pick it up. I think maybe if you were just super excited about the first game, then maybe you'll already be jumping in. I understand that people have to keep their people busy and uh, art and the writers and all that other kind of fun stuff. In order to uh, keep them around, you got to keep them working. But uh, maybe a different project in between would have been better. Instead of another expansion, maybe give people a chance to enjoy the game. You know, there's there's some value to those criticisms. Uh, otherwise, you have twins Hjalva and Halven, which are Viking based. So if you want to bring those in, uh, with some extra weapons, traps, treasures, armors, potions, and six dungeon campaign. Uh, would go into this so if you liked the idea of the original game 
um, and you think you would want more that you hadn't, didn't get enough on the first round or through stretch goals or whatever the case is, then here's your opportunity to expand that out. And I hope those of you that actually played the game will come back or maybe even just back it for a dollar and uh, try to pick it up later in the pledge manager. I think they should offer that as an option. Blacklist did uh, just to make sure people would get refunds if they didn't like their stuff because their stuff was running late. And uh, I think more people should take that kind of integrity approach. And if you like hexes and you like jigsaw puzzles, then maybe Hexano is for you. You're going to be matching the different sides and trying to create a mosaic tile thing uh, out of the, uh, the colors that you've got. So you have to match the sides up. And um, I don't know how many different repeating patterns they could have. I'm sure somebody out there can do the math. I'm sure it's a lot. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting concept. And um, at a certain point, you're going to be increasing the difficulty as you run out of uh, different tiles. And uh, that makes for a pretty cool little game. So check it out if you're into those types of puzzles. Uh, I've seen a lot of these types of things as um, like uh, Flash games from way back when, like 20 years ago. And... Uh, uh, conceptually it's uh, a neat idea it's like you're instead of just having a jigsaw puzzle for yourself and other people in there then uh, you know the the added complexity um, you guys can you can do a lot with it just put it that way and it doesn't matter how many people you add just like if you're adding onto a jigsaw uh, puzzle itself uh, the more people that are working on it you can discuss things talk back and forth all that kind of stuff and uh, you know build something nice then we have uh, love at first draw which is basically cards against humanity as far as um, the call and response cards are, are set up but uh, it's supposed to be something about couples counseling created by a bunch of people at the University of Southern California having partied down at the University of Southern California I can tell you that um, they don't know nothing about uh, relationships beyond the age of 23 and maybe that's the target audience for this. Not really for somebody who has a long-standing relationship or any of that kind of stuff. If that's the case, just go play Cards Against Humanity. So, um, what does the Palace of Versailles have to do with So What Are We? I see So What Are We and I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? We're people. Like mammals? What are you asking about? And if that's supposed to create an argument between two people, how is that a fun game? it's not so that's why I am not suggesting it as a fun one opposite of that is an actual game this is Pisces this is a game about fishing but you have a conservation mechanic so you go out there and you catch the most fish possible and you score points but there is something set up so that you have to leave enough fish so that you will have a healthy fishery for the next time you go out there and you can catch sharks mahi crab sardines tuna snapper all the fun tasty fish that are out there and uh, each round what's going to be available changes so that's a pretty cool deal deadliest catch this year was all about uh, having questionable um, population of crab available so they had to go out and uh, they weren't sure that they would have a healthy fishery. So they had to worry about how much they could catch, whether or not there were actual crabs still in the water. This is like that for a game, but with a lot more species. Uh, the card art uh, looks pretty neat along with it. It's got a neat message. Hey, man, if you can catch some or teach some people that are used to just running out there on the boat and catching fish and all that. Also how to think about how to conserve the numbers or start them on that early so they can think about it. The oceans are 90% overfished. This, I think, is a great message, a great way to teach it, and uh, possibly a good game to go along with it. Next up, we have another food game, and this is Pot Yuck. This is about coming up with horrible food combos, and uh, whoever makes the worst food is the winner. So you're gonna have an inventory, uh, food spices and methods, and then you uh, work your way up as a dishwasher through ranks, recipes, and kitchen items, and uh, somebody is going to be the manager, and the manager is going to pick the worst cook. So, um, yeah, I made some terrible spice rub. Um, I usually, because I work out uh, most nights, 
that uh, and then I put some cinnamon and sometimes I throw some other spices in and I thought maybe uh, some cardamom might be good with the cinnamon and I grabbed the wrong thing and it was fennel and I was like oh but then I put the cardamom in anyway with the cinnamon and I was like let's just see how it goes it's awful it is awful that fennel does not work with anything so um, that was in that maybe it works for something some other type of food or whatever thing is but it does not work in those concentrations or those combinations I would be the winner of this game with that type of combination so yeah check it out sometimes you know the ew taste this reaction is uh, is a lot of fun for people and uh, you know you can share it with this type of game then we have a two-player skirmish battle that takes place in space you got all kinds of ships and other cool stuff to go along with it I don't see any minis so it's all card driven um, but that's not necessarily a problem you can get a print and play version if you like and uh, check it out you got all types of ships and other cool stuff dune the 4k uh uhd uh disc is coming out in july um you know there's always star wars there's always battlestar galactica there's always all these other space things that could inspire you to to play some games and uh why not just give it a shot with the skirmish share there's a book that you can throw in some minis of whatever kind if you want to switch these out there are uh, I mean, the, the one we saw at the very beginning with the little uh, hockey puck things that have the AR attached to it, um, that have ships and whatnot, they'd be great for this, wouldn't they? Just think about that. Then we have War Room, which is a strategy board game. This is the second edition for two to six players, and it takes a big table because you got the whole freaking map. And uh, the idea here is the, the map is huge but you're going to take certain things off the board as you move through it so that part is an interesting idea um it's like putting together a puzzle doing all kinds of weird fun stuff um you can check out the reviews of the first edition i like things that have a second edition because that means that the first edition was successful and people liked it and even though this thing started with a, an ask of 150 grand they were able to raise it in almost no time so those are all good signs if you were a strategy gamer, if you're a war gamer. I do not see the little pieces that you typically see with uh, the units um, on the war games. So I don't think it's that kind of World War II uh, setup. Um, it's interesting that it has um, Europe as the center of the map. You don't see too many maps that are set up that way. And it helps you kind of figure out how the theater would work. Um, so there's less um, going on in other parts of the world where there wasn't as much conflict. So things at the southern part of Africa and the bottom of South America and all that kind of stuff uh, aren't really on the map. But otherwise, you have all the European stuff going crazy and all that. It's just a different way of seeing the world. It's like what the sun sees, right, when it looks down on us. So I think that's pretty neat. And that's the end of a very long episode. But I got another really long episode just about to happen. So if you've been enjoying these as I put them out every week, and giving you as uh, in-depth an understanding of what's happening in Kickstarters and all that kind of fun stuff, then uh, feel free to like and subscribe. It would help me out. Keep in mind all of the ads that you see, if there are any between the episode uh, at the beginning. Unless you guys hit subscribe, they are not going to share any of that revenue with me. It's just there to annoy you, and then YouTube sucks up all the money, and I do all the work. So uh, if you think that I should get a little bit of that sweet, sweet green, then uh, feel free to hit that like, subscribe. If you think that any of your friends would like to be informed of what happens in Kickstarter, feel free to share. And uh, hit thumbs up if you think that uh, you like the episode and it deserves it. That's always helpful. I am going to get that RPG episode started so that I can have a nice free weekend to watch some movies, kick back, relax. This is the first time that I know I haven't had to work on a weekend in, I would say, 13 years, maybe 14 years. So uh, that includes holidays because I've been on call for all of those during that time uh, for the most part. So I'm going to try to enjoy it. It's going to be a little weird happen like just dead time. But I'm going to finish up all the episodes tonight so you'll be able to enjoy those. And I'll be able to enjoy Quiet Place 2. Maybe I'll get some painting in. I haven't done painting in a while. I've got a bunch of zombies staring at me. Maybe, heaven forbid, 
I might be able to even get some game time in. Fingers crossed. We'll see how it goes. You guys have a good one.